Okay, everybody, I think it's about time for us to go ahead and get started with our third installment of this webinar series that we are running on the Git Microsoft 365 Developer Certified. Today, we are going to focus on SharePoint. Um, before we get started, just to double check, make sure every, I did it in the chat just a minute ago, but let's just double check and make sure um, if you would use the hand icon or the hands up uh, feature inside of Zoom, um, let me know that you can raise your hand. Tell me if you can and tell me if you uh, can hear me, if you can see me on the video, if you can also uh, see the slides. I see lots of hands going up, which that tells me that everything is good. And now you can put all of your hands back down. There we go. Everything great. Nope, not the wrong mic again. Oh, let's just double check and make sure I'm on the right mic. Nope, we are on the correct mic. Sweet. All right, so we are good. So got somebody just double checking on it again. We are on the right mic. You should be able to hear me on this one. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, in today's webinar, we're going to be talking about the SharePoint feature or the SharePoint capability uh, workload inside the MS600 exam. Um, if you would uh, uh, just bear with me for just a minute, um, do a quick little introduction. We'll talk a little bit about the exam and the certification for those people who have not attended any of our previous webinars, and then we're gonna dive in to the SharePoint specific content. So really quick, my name is Andrew Connell. Um, I've been involved uh, with uh, SharePoint development actually for about 17 years now. Um, also a member of the Patterns and Practices uh, group uh, with the Microsoft 365, and also a Microsoft MVP for office development. Um, I co-host a podcast called the Microsoft Cloud Show, and then I also have a training business where I have a SharePoint framework uh, online on-demand video course uh, as well um, on my company, Voitanos. Um, you got my contact info there, as you can see uh, from the slide. One of the things, um, one of the reasons why I'm doing this uh, webinar series is because I was involved quite a bit uh, last year in 2019, uh, working with Microsoft in both developing the topics that would be covered on the exam, um, and then also developing a bunch of the self-paced content uh, that people are gonna use uh, to study for the exam. Um, let's go to my slides. Let's talk a little bit about the exam itself and the certification to make sure that you understand kind of in context, what are we looking at here from a high level? Um, the Microsoft 365 certified um, associate developer uh, certification. What this does is this is, gonna, is this is going to measure you on five of the different workloads that we have in Microsoft 365. That includes Azure, Microsoft Identity, which is really just Azure AD. Um, it's Microsoft Graph. It's SharePoint, what we're gonna cover today. Microsoft Teams and Office add-ins. So all five of these different workloads. Um, we've already done two uh, webinars in this series. Uh, the first one was on Microsoft Identity. The second one was on um, Microsoft Graph and uh, to where you can actually um, get access uh, to those webinars. I will show you a link for that. Actually, I think on the next slide. Nope, not on the next slide, on the next, next slide uh, where you can get access to those recordings. Um, we will make this recording also available. Same with the next two and uh, three webinars that we're gonna do um, as well. Um, you might want to wonder, you know, so why should you listen to me talk about this stuff? Well, I've taken the exam. Um, I've passed it. I am a certified, a Microsoft 365 certified associate developer. Um, what you can see here, I wanted to show you like my results. Now, when I took the exam, it was in beta. That was back in early January of 2020. Um, the exam is not a uh, was at the time was in beta. It was not generally available. Um, anybody could have taken it back in the beta. They had a certain limit on the number of beta exams they were going to offer. And I jumped on one of those and um, it's changed a little bit since I took it, but for the most part, it's the same content. It's just some of the questions kind of got tweaked a little bit um, from when I took it. Um, and what you can see here, you can just see like, you know, what the, what the spread is. I show you like my experience here. So you can, you know, you know where I fit on the whole scale. Um, the nice thing is, is that with the exam, you only need to get a 70% or higher to pass. Um, those different bars represent the 20 point, 20 percentage points mark. So uh, for what we're talking about today for SharePoint, um, I scored it about a 93-ish, something like that, 94-ish on all the exam, all the questions that were asked. Um, 
I will say that I think that some of the ones that I missed on in a bunch of the different areas, not all of them, but a bunch of them, the ones I missed, I know I had feedback for them that some of the questions I thought were not good questions, um, that when it would say choose the correct answer, I thought that there were three correct answers. It's like if you've ever taken a certification exam for Microsoft, it's you always run into this and there's always an it depends kind of component um, and you just got to do the best you can. All right. Um, but for SharePoint, you can see there, I fit right around like the 93 ish point. Um, if you're interested in taking the exam, uh, don't worry if you are not fantastic in terms of your strength, your back, your, your technical background in all five of the different workloads, you don't have to be fantastic in all the five different workloads. You really only have to be, um, at 70% across the entire board or higher. Um, so like, for example, you see in the extending office, which talks about office add-ins, um, I was only uh, about, a, about a 75 or 76% um, on those, uh, on that section. Um, well, in my case, it didn't really matter because I still got a, uh, I st it still is above 70. But you can see that even one area isn't going to bring you all the way down. It's not going to take, even if you got, a, if I got a zero in that section, it wasn't going to. Uh, fail me on the exam. So if you have one area that you're not as strong at, that's okay. It's not that big of a deal. Let's talk a little bit here about the certification itself. And now why I'm doing this, I'm curious. Let me get a, a uh, I'm going to launch a little poll here um, in Zoom. So you should see something pop up in the client. Um, and I'm curious how many of you are interested in taking the exam and how many of you are just kind of, ah, maybe I might do it, kind of thinking about it. Some of you have tuned into the webinar for, I don't really know why, because you're going to say, no, I'm not interested in taking it. Um, or, hey, maybe you've already taken it. And you're just fact checking me and making sure that, I, that I'm not lying to you. Let me talk to you while you're doing that. Let me talk to you a little bit about the exam itself and the certification, right? So the way that this works is that the certification is called Microsoft 365 Certified Developer Associate. I got a link to it right there that you see on the slide. Um, the, the certification itself is only, uh, and actually let me, go, let me, before I jump in, sorry, explaining this, start going through this. Um, if you have any questions, um, please make sure that you use the zoom question answer panel. Um, there is a chat feature inside of zoom. Uh, I'm that goes by really quick and a lot of people post their questions, but then they post them just to me and not to everybody in the chat. I'm gonna to try to watch the chat a little bit, but for the most part, I'm gonna focus on questions over on the QA panel. So please post your questions over there um, and I will get to them uh, throughout the, the entire webinar. We should have plenty of time to answer your, any of your questions. Okay, let's go back to the certification itself. Um, so the way that the certification works is that there is one prerequisite to achieve the certification. And that is to take the, um, uh, that is to uh, uh, take and pass a single exam. So think of the certification. This came up in one of our previous webinars. Like, what do I have to do to make the certification? Think of the certification as your trophy for passing the exam. All right. That's really all it is. You have to pass the exam and then you get, and then you're, you're certified. Now it's important to understand. I'm kind of jumping around on the slide here, um, but I like to keep it. I like to kind of do this a little bit to kind of mix it up. The think of the certification as a way that you're being tested in terms of your skill and your background level for uh, Microsoft 365 development. So the way that Microsoft learning tests you is three different levels. You've got the foundational level, you've got the associate level, and you've got the expert level. Now they have their own definitions of this and mine are pretty close to it, but I think that mine are a little bit, I like to explain them in the following ways. I think it's easier to kind of understand the context. If you are a foundational, if you're at the foundational level of knowledge for a technology, then if you're familiar with the, the role of a, what's a technical sales uh, professional or a technical solution pro, um, professional or a TSP for Microsoft, or if you're just involved in like technical pre-sales for your company, that's, a, that's foundational. That is somebody who can walk into a customer, the customer can tell them what they're trying to do or what problem they have, and you could come up with a solution using the technology that we're gonna talk about today or Microsoft 365 technologies, you could talk about them and design a system, maybe like on the back of a cocktail napkin or on a whiteboard. You can't implement it. You may not be able to implement it. You may not be able to fully implement it. You may not know the APIs, 
but you at least know what's possible. You know how things work, generally work, you know what's possible. And that's the kind of stuff that you need for a, t a foundational knowledge. If, you, um, if you're at the associate level, that is someone who can do this stuff, can actually go implement it. And that's someone that I would put at like the four, what Microsoft likes to look at as somebody who's got about four years of experience or more with this technology. Um, and I don't take that literally because I mean, clearly things like Microsoft Teams and um, the SharePoint framework, they haven't been around for four years, but you get, you kind of get the point. Like the goal is to have somebody who's got that level of knowledge, okay? The next level up is the associate level. And think of that as somebody who can teach. That's somebody who can, who, can, who can teach someone at the foundational level and get them to the associate level. The certification is testing you or the certification is measuring you at that associate level, right? So that's kind of the ballpark or where you're looking like, well, how, what do I need to do to do this? Am I over my head? Do I have enough experience? That kind of stuff, okay? Um, that's one of the things you wanna look at. Then of course, go look at all the different uh, topics that are going to be covered. And we're going to go through the SharePoint ones here in this webinar. So then there's an exam. Then the exam that you have to take in order to get that certification, the way Microsoft figures out, yeah, you're, you're, you're associate level at this, is they have an exam called the Building Applications and Solutions with Microsoft 365 Core Services. The code is MS600. And I got a link to it there on the slide. Now what this is, this is gonna cover all five of the workloads. And technically the way it's supposed to work is that you're supposed to be tested at the associate level for identity and graph and foundational level at SharePoint, Teams, and Office add-ins. But I can tell you from my experience that some of those questions that I saw on the exam, specifically around Teams and add-ins and SharePoint framework, there was no way that those, th that those were foundational questions. They were easily associate questions. In my mind, if I'm seeing API calls, specific API calls, or like what property should you be setting here, or what does this property mean? That stuff to me, that's associate level. So I think you wanna be associate level across the entire board. And why do I say that? Well, when we were building the, the spec for the exam, um, it, I was of the opinion along with a lot of other people that we couldn't do associate across the board because when Microsoft puts an exam out there, they have to provide uh, instructor-led training for the exam as well. And I was of the opinion that to adequately get somebody trained up at the associate level for all five of these workloads, you would need anywhere from three to four weeks of uh, hands-on training. And there was no way that that was gonna happen logistically. So I, when just because of working in the business rules, I said, you gotta scale back. That was my opinion. Some things didn't happen that way, but I at least had my opinion. All right, um, I did see one question from Tim. He says, how many questions are on the test? I think it was somewhere between like, man, you know, that's a great question. He's like, I've totally forgotten about this. I want to say it was somewhere in the 50s, somewhere around that, like 50-ish range. It's a bit of an, an, adapt, an adaptive test. And what I mean by that is that there is a pool of SharePoint questions, a pool of graph, pool of identity, pool of, there's a pool of questions. And they are going, those questions are going to be, um, based on, on how you're doing in the exam, they're going to pull different questions or they're going to be different if you took the exam and if I took the exam. So you can't, you can't adequately, like if you tried to, you couldn't cheat for this thing. Um, even if you took it at home in the social distancing world that we're in right now, even if you took the exam from home, it is, there's no way you can get around with cheating. Um, if you, even if you tried. So uh, I'll talk more about that when we do the, um, if you're interested, we can talk about that at the end of the webinar, but not, not that I cheated, but I can tell you like what the experience is in taking it from home. Um, and then um, we have another webinar we're doing at the very end of this series. Uh, it'll be a week from this coming Thursday, which is a behind the scenes. And it's gonna be a lot more of like, if you're interested in how they build an exam and, and stuff like that. Um, so with that being said, so yeah, that's the, that's the part of, that's the, um, the number of question exam. I think it's around 50-ish. They give you, I think, like two or three hours, if I, if I recall, to finish the entire exam. And I, and you, I went, when I took it, I think it was somewhere like, I, I only needed like about an hour, hour and a half. Um, you will have plenty of time to, to complete the exam um, and not feel rushed. I do remember, I, that is one thing I definitely remember. You won't feel rushed. Um, if you are feeling rushed and having to answer certain questions uh, and at the very end, then you're probably 
you, you probably need to study a bit more. You're probably a little deficient on some areas. That's, that's what my, you should be able to look at the questions, maybe study them for like a couple minutes and then be able to answer it. Okay. Um, Melissa has a question. Um, if we're not confident with the associate level, would the foundational level help prepare us for training in the associate level? Is there a foundational test? So, I mean, yeah, if you know stuff at the foundational level, would it help you with this test? Uh, kinda, but not, not much. And the reason why I don't think it's going to help you all that much is because you have the things that I would, the, the questions I would ask you at the, at the foundational level are not the things that I would ask you on the foundational level. I mean, frankly, if, if you are at the associate level, if you, if you know things at a foundational level and that's it, you will have a very hard time with this exam. Uh, okay. That's just, I mean, plainly stated, you're going to have a very hard time with this exam. Um, you need to be at the associate level. You need to know API calls. You know how to be able, like in the SharePoint framework world or the SharePoint exam, as we're going to go through, you'll see the topics. I'll explain as I go through these slides, the level that you need to know, um, as I have with the other webinars and I will with the, uh, with the future ones in this, in this, um, uh, in this uh, series. Let me go ahead and let me share the results here, what everybody said. So let's share those results. There we go. So you should be able to see the results of the poll. Um, so, uh, you should be, yeah, you, you'll, you'll get a feel for like what level you need to be at for these. Um, but no, there's, there's, as far as I know, there is not a foundational exam for this. Um, there is not uh, the IT pro exam for this. I, I think that's MS 700. Um, that will not help you with this at all either. Um, because it, that's, that's going to deal with totally different topics. But I will give you, I will point to some stuff where you can, uh, some self-paced stuff that you can look at. Actually, is it right there? No, it's not there. It is, I think I have it towards the end. Okay, now with this. So let's just talk about this series very briefly. Like I said, this is the third installment um, into this series, this webinar series that I'm doing on Get Microsoft 365 Developer Certified. Um, the first one we did last Tuesday, that was on Microsoft Identity. Yes, that is supposed to be a lowercase i. Trust me, I found out the hard way from their content review group. That's what it, supposed to be lowercase i. It says Microsoft Identity, but as we talked about in that webinar, it's really 100% Azure AD. There's no Microsoft um, accounts, no MSAs. Last Thursday, we covered Microsoft Graph. Today, we're covering SharePoint. In two days, we're going to cover Microsoft Teams. Next week, we're going to cover Office add-ins. And the last one, which is a week from this coming Thursday, is a bonus behind the scenes one. If you missed any of these in the past, they're all being recorded. I will post the links to the recordings once they are made available to me. Um, usually it's about a day, maybe two days. Um, if you go to the link there that you see at the bottom of that slide, uh, it is all case sensitive. Um, everything is lowercase. And just to make it a little bit easier to read, I changed the colors around a little bit. Um, so you can see it's uh, vtns.io slash get m365 dev certified series. From that link, you will find uh, links to the registration for future webinars that I'm doing in this series. So if you want to get any of the other ones, Teams, add-ins, or uh, the behind the scenes. Um, and you can grab the, the link to where the recordings are posted for each one of these that you could go watch as well if you happen to miss it. Okay. Uh, I did see one question come in. Someone asked if they could get the slides for these webinars. Slides aren't being shared. Um, the recordings are being shared. So you can always go back and you can rewatch the recordings that are made uh, on demand. Okay, so let's, let's, let's start diving into the SharePoint side of this. What do you need to know? What, what's with the SharePoint section? The SharePoint, SharePoint section is going to take up about 20 to 25% of the questions on the exam. And the focus is, for the most part, and as you'll see from the slides that are coming up, the focus is almost exclusive. I shouldn't say exclusively, it's mostly on the SharePoint framework, right? It's mostly on the SharePoint framework, specifically SharePoint Online, right? It is, this is a Microsoft 365 uh, certification. So it's about, the, the, about Microsoft 365, which is SharePoint Online, all right? Uh, in this case, it's SharePoint Online. Um, there are also some questions that are related to some of the declarative um, customizations that you can do, specifically around the list formatting, like row and column level formatting that you can use JSON uh, to do some stuff with, and site designs and site scripts. There's not much on list formatting and site designs and site scripts. Most of it, like 
maybe like 80 or 90% of the questions are related to the SharePoint framework. Very, very, very little is, uh, of this SharePoint section deals with uh, declarative formatting, okay? There's no questions about SharePoint add-ins like provider hosted or SharePoint hosted. There's no questions about like details about features, um, the feature XML, event receivers, stuff like that. Any of the old server side style stuff, none of that. There's no questions related to that stuff. It is, all, it is about what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to use today to customize uh, SharePoint Online, which is SharePoint framework and declarative formatting. Now, when it comes down to languages and like web frameworks, what should you know there? SharePoint framework is almost entirely TypeScript. Yes, I mean, really that means JavaScript, but it's almost entirely TypeScript. There are no, if, if I'm not mistaken, there are no questions related to, um, that are gonna deal with like .NET framework. I don't recall anything about the CSOM. I, I, I may be wrong, there may be like very, one or two, but I'm almost positive there's no questions related to the client side object model in SharePoint. Um, any of the questions that you're dealing with when you're going to get data from SharePoint is all gonna be related to the SharePoint REST API. You can get data through Microsoft Graph to get from SharePoint lists and libraries, but there, will be no, there are no questions that deal with that part of the graph. As we talked about last week, the only graph questions are going to deal with like users, groups, and files when it comes down to those different resources that you access in Graph. For SharePoint, we use the REST API. There are also no questions related to web frameworks. Um, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, we tr they, the, the, the exam question writers worked really hard to make sure there was nothing React on it, that everything's pure JavaScript. And the reason for that is because React is not a required technology that you need to know for customizing SharePoint. It's an enabling technology. It's one that can make your life a little more productive as a, develop, as a web developer, but it's not required. So you don't have to know React to pass this exam, okay? There is, and this maybe goes back to Melissa's question a minute ago, there are some self-paced learning uh, modules that are available on Microsoft Learn. There's an entire learning path that you see that's posted there. And in fact, I wrote most, I wrote all that content. That was um, content that if you were familiar with the SharePoint framework training that uh, Microsoft had talked about in like their community calls uh, from uh, by Avesa Yuvenen, um, this content is that content. We ported it all over into MS Learn and refreshed it to make sure everything was current. Um, of all of the modules we ported, the one that we did not port was React because of what I just said a minute ago. Okay, so that's a good self-paced uh, learning kind of content. And what I would, you know, to go back to Melissa, your question that you had a minute ago, if you go through the labs and you go through these modules, the labs that are inside these modules and all the lectures and stuff associated with them, if you feel comfortable with that content, then you should feel comfortable with the exam. If you don't feel comfortable with that content, you need to get yourself to that level. And then I would say you're comfortable to take the exam. Okay. All right. Now, before we go into the SharePoint section, I've got another question for you guys. If you don't mind me asking another poll question. And if you've already done this, hey, you know, I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate you answering these polls in previous webinars, but we're gonna ask it again. This next question, this next poll has got two questions. They're both basically the same, but there's a difference. The first one is asking of these five workloads that you can take for this exam for the MS600, First question says, which one do you have the most experience or are you the strongest at? The second question is, which one do you have the least experience with or are you the weakest at? So first one is, which one do I feel like I don't have to study for, right? Second one is, which one am I the weakest at, right? And this is interesting because I'm seeing most of the people saying that they feel the strongest on SharePoint. So what are you doing in this webinar? I'm just kidding. You're welcome to stick around. Um, but yeah, that's the, I find that to be interesting. Like 90% of you are saying that SharePoint, you're the strongest at. Now here's one that's interesting. Which one are you the weakest at? Of course, nobody's saying SharePoint. Most of you are saying Office add-ins. There you go, All right? So that's something. Oh, so somebody had a good point there. Why you, why'd you tune into the webinar? Because you wanna find out what's on the exam. That's a good point, Joseph. Okay, so while that's up, let's go ahead, um, leave that. 
Uh, let's see, 67. Yeah, it's good enough. All right, so we're going to go ahead and close the poll down in five seconds. Four, three, two, one, and we're done. Sweet. So thank you very much for answering that. Okay, now I got another poll question for you, but not yet. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Let's see. So Michael said, strongest does not equal strong with the current inclination of SharePoint. Oh, so SharePoint is your strongest, but it doesn't mean that it's that you're actually strong at it. That makes sense. So relatively speaking, good point. Didn't even think about it like that. Poorly asked question. Good thing I didn't write the exam questions. So I wasn't allowed to write the exam questions because uh, I have a training business on um, Voitanos where I do like a SharePoint framework training. And had I written the questions, I would have been, it would have been a conflict of interest to build and to sell training and education materials um, on the topics that the, that the sort of, that I wrote exam questions for, which is kind of ironic because I was asked to write questions for it, yet I was also asked to do the self-paced learning content that I just referenced a second ago for Microsoft. So they would have asked me to write the questions, but then that would have precluded me from writing the content, the self-paced content for them. I brought that to their attention when legal got involved and I was like, how can I do both of these? And they're like, yeah, you can't. And Microsoft's like, he can't. So I was like, mm, I don't want to do the questions. Let me focus on the content. So that's why I don't have, I'm not giving you specifics on the questions. I have to tell you what my experience is because I was, I was firewalled. I was not allowed to see any of those things. John, oh, John, thank you very much. I appreciate that. But you sent that comment just to all panelists. You didn't, nobody else saw it. Send it again, send it to everybody. <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk about the SharePoint content here. So what do you need to know to pass the SharePoint section of the exam? Okay, this is kind of tough. I'm gonna do my best with this because I don't wanna say that, you know, hey, it's no problem to pass this because I live this, I live this world. I live the SharePoint framework development world. So to me, it all is like second nature. So this is a great time to start asking those questions. We've only got like, I only got like five or six slides related to the different topics here, the main silos of things you need to focus on. All right, so step one, you need to understand the components and uh, specifically of a SharePoint framework web part. So what does that mean? You need to understand when I go to create something with a SharePoint framework, what am I using? And what do I mean by that is like, what's the build tool chain look like for the SharePoint framework? You're using Node, you're using Yeoman, you're using a Yeoman generator, you're using Gulp, you're using NPM. And you should understand how those things fit into the whole model, right? You should understand that, you know, when you do Gulp serve, what does that do? Not just Gulp serve, I'm doing this. and, and if you are using the terminology like I gulp served this and I've got, Share, the, I've got SharePoint running on my local machine, you might be like, ah, let's go back and let's read up on this a little bit because what are you really doing? You didn't gulp serve it. You're running a task that is doing a bunch of things behind the scenes, building and bundling, spinning up a local web server to host a web page, and that local web page is loading the SharePoint framework. Um, on that local page so that you don't really have SharePoint installed. You just have a page that's mocked up with a SharePoint framework, okay? That's what's happening under the covers. You should understand how to set properties on a client side web part. And what I mean by that, when I say implement, to, 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 um, to implement properties on our public properties is you need to be able to, um, know how to not only go through and to customize, how to, how to give users the ability to, to change a property, so using the property pane and how you bind those things, but then you also need to know how to, how to set them initially. And you do that from the manifest file and the um, pre-configured properties section. You also should know how to leverage the Office UI fabric in client-side web parts, and specifically, in that case here, you, you would be using React, but you don't have to know a de like a lot of detail on doing, you don't need to know React uh, per se, but you should know the Office UI fabric uh, stuff. It's, this is an interesting section um, and we're gonna see how this evolves. So if you, if you go out and take this exam, I'd say in the next month, everything I'm saying right now is definitely true. What we don't know is how, I guess if, and if so, how, they are going to change the exam 
from anything that they talk about related to the Office UI fabric at the upcoming uh, virtual build conference at the end of May. They've publicly talked about changes that they are doing to try and unify Office UI fabric and some other stuff with an, uh, their UI um, library called Fluent. Um, and if you if you watch the the um, the Fluent uh, repository uh, and GitHub and you see their activity, they are they are very active right now. Coming out with they're doing multiple lots of releases. It seems like every other day. So. How does that change relate, relation to SharePoint framework? We don't know because we haven't seen what it's gonna do and what the story is gonna be if they talk about it at Ignite. So we don't, we don't really know that. Um, you have to also understand how and when you would use an app page. And what I mean by that is that you can take a web part and you can add it as a little component that you can that develop, that users can put anywhere on a page. But if, if, you, if, if you know, if, you, if you're aware of this, you can create that, that uh, web part and you can say it can be used as an app page. Effectively, your web part is a single page app, a spa. And it, you can have it get, uh, have, you can let the, give the users the ability to create a brand new page and have that page is just a giant canvas with that web part statically added to it and no way to go through and to remove that web part or add other web parts to the page. It's not, a, it's not a canvas in a sense. I mean, it, it, there's one canvas on the page, but there's no edit capabilities to that canvas. You can edit the page and edit that web part, but you can't add more web parts to it. So how do you do that? How does that work? How is that different from a standard um, web part that you would put on the page? Um, is it different? That's kind of a trick question, right? It really isn't. There's nothing different about it. There's just a little string that you've added or that you've removed to make it work as a web part or as um, a full page app page, okay? It's, and it, the story is basically the exact same between the two. You do need to understand the different rendering options that we have available to us. And when I say, when it says understand rendering framework options, you just need to understand that, what does it mean when you're asked no web frame, no JavaScript framework, React, Knockout, can you use Angular, stuff like that. You don't have to know how to go implement that stuff, just kind of, you know, how to do that stuff. Oh, Kathy, thank you so much. John, thank you so much for the comment in the chat. And Kathy, thank you. Oh, sorry, Kathleen, thank you for the comment as well. My mother-in-law's name is Kathy. So, and I was just talking to her right before this. It's my anniversary today. So like she called and was like, oh, thank you. So I was just talking to Kathy. So it screwed me up. Um, let's see, so what's next? Oh, so that's web parts. Um, let me see if I got any questions. Here. Okay, so I got a, I got a couple of questions that came in, um, but uh, these are not specific to web part. So we're gonna keep going and I'll get to your questions um, at the end. That goes for Warren, oh, Warren, Warren and Melissa. So I'll come back. All right, the other thing you need to know about are extensions, right? So what about extensions? You like just a classic clip art there that I threw in there? It's a clip art. I found, I was trying to find a picture that would show things being built off of something else and everything that I did that it just didn't, it was all like baking stuff and that didn't make sense. So, so what is this? So you need to understand as far as the SharePoint framework goes, what extensions are, what extensions are available to you. And today there are four extensions. We may get more, but you're probably only going to be tested on one of the four or the four. Um, one of them is an application customizer. Now, first, that first bullet was says, identify the appropriate tool to create an extension project. It's kind of a trick question, right? Um, that is, and I'm, what I've done is I've taken the skills that they have told you that you need to know, and I'm giving you my two cents on it, okay? So they tell you, identify the appropriate tool. Well, if you know the build tool chain, you know that. It's gonna be you know, the Yeoman generator, Yeoman, the Yeoman generator, you use Node to run it, NPM to install dependencies, you're, and then some text editor. Um, you Preferably VS Code, well, in my opinion, VS Code. All the demos, all the examples are all gonna use VS Code, um, but you can really use anything you want. Um, you need to understand um, how to, what application customizers are and how to add placeholders to the page, how to go through and do uh, uh, header placeholders and footer placeholders as well, and how those work um, and what it means to go through and to leverage those and where they're available and where they're not available. There's a, there's a trick question, right? Extensions are only available on modern pages in SharePoint 
online. I, technically in SharePoint on, on prem on SharePoint 2019 as well, but they're only available in on modern pages. You need to understand what a list view command set extension is and what kinds of things you can do with it. Where can it surface in the toolbar of lists and libraries um, in the context menu of items in lists and libraries. Um, what kinds of events do, does it raise that you can trap and that you can that you can take advantage of. You need to understand what a field customizer is. The fact that we can customize the display section of a uh, the list view, the list rendering view um, of a list, look like at the grid view. And you understand what you can do with that um, and how that works and where that is available and how you would deploy that. Um, for extensions, it doesn't say this in the, in the skills, but you should know how are these things getting installed in SharePoint? And the answer is they're using features. They're using the SharePoint features. If you understand how it works, then you can answer the question. You can answer the question easier, I should say. Once you know how to build these two different things, you should know how to package and deploy your solutions. You should know, you should understand the process of, I know what building is, I know what bundling is, I know what packaging the solution is. I know the difference between using the production and the, the development flag. Well, the development flag is implied, but using the dash dash ship or the dash P flag, they mean the same thing. What it means and what the implication is when you choose that, right? What the implication is and what it means when you don't choose that, what do you get? Um, you should understand you know, what the different deployment options you have for your component. You can use tenant scoped app catalogs. You can use site collection scoped app catalogs. When you do a tenant scoped app catalog, what does it mean to be tenant scope deployment, right? Or tenant wide deployment? What does that mean, right? What does it mean if I deploy something to my tenant scoped app catalog? Who can use it? Same question. What if I deploy it to my site collection scoped app catalog? Who can use it? Who cannot use it? Stuff like that. Another aspect that you should understand about is the concept of domain isolated web parts. Why and what should you do? What, why, why, should, why would you want to do a domain isolated web part? And when, when you do that, what does that really mean? What does it mean to be domain isolated? These are all, all this information is in the docs, right? Uh, from a high level, just if you don't know what this is and you want to go search the docs, basically what this is is that when web parts are, uh, are rendered normally, they're rendered in a div. When you do domain isolated, they're rendered in an iframe and they're surfaced from a custom domain. Um, the reason they do that is because if they're coming from a totally separate top level domain than the rest of the SharePoint pages, then they can't do cross domain calls from the browser. And it's, just, it's basically a security feature. So SharePoint can't call into that domain and client side because of course it's gonna block the cores request and then same thing coming back out. It's also a permissioning um, uh, thing as well. It's a security kind of a thing. Um, you should know about domain isolated web parts. You should also know how the different um, options for you have for deploying a solution. So that kind of came down to what I just mentioned that I mentioned a minute ago. And that was things like, um, the uh, tenant scope deployment. Um, what was the other one? Tenant scope deployment and um, uh, tenant wide uh, deployment. Ron's got a good question here. Um, it's pertinent to what we're talking about, so I'm going to address it. Do we know? Do we need to know about? I'm going to rephrase your question. Um, I'm going to play politics. I'm going to answer the question that I want to answer, not the one you asked. Just kidding. Um, do we know about updating web parts and extensions in the tenant? So really you're asking, do we need to know how to update uh, web parts and extensions? Answer is yes. You need to understand that when you deploy, when you upgrade something, what does that do? If I need, when, when do I need to change the version number of my component or my solution? When do I need to do it? When can I do it? When do I not need to do it? You, you should understand those different concepts. Okay. All right, next topic, understand how to consume the Microsoft graph. Now this is not knowing how to, how to, how to, uh, how to use, uh, let's see, how do I say this? This is only, how do I use the Microsoft graph from SharePoint framework solutions and SharePoint online uh, client side? This is not, how does the graph work? How do I talk to the user endpoint? 
This is not getting detailed in the graph. That's for the graph section of the, of the, of the, the exam. This is about how can I use graph, Microsoft Graph in the SharePoint framework solution? You need to understand what Microsoft has done. And we're gonna talk about this also on the next slide as well. But and it really, in my mind, you really should switch these two things around. So in fact, let's do that. So let's talk about this first and then we're gonna come back to the, the graph slide. So you need to understand um, how to consume third-party APIs that are secured with Azure AD from the SharePoint framework. Sorry, it looks like something got cut off there and the slide got rendered, but it's from the SharePoint framework. So you need to understand how Microsoft is doing this. SharePoint online only thing. So you wanna go research and go study up on the fact that every SharePoint online tenant gets his own Azure AD app. It's got this really long name, something like SharePoint web, uh, SharePoint client side web extensibility, something like that. It's an Azure AD app that every SharePoint online, every Office 3, sorry, every Microsoft 365 tenant has in their associated Azure AD um, uh, directory tenant. When you want your SharePoint framework component to be able to call a, a, an endpoint that is secured with Azure AD, be it one that you create, uh, that's maybe living as an Azure web app or as an Azure function, uh, be it one that already exists, like Microsoft Graph or like Dynamics or any of the other ones that, are, that Microsoft has that are, that are secured with Azure AD. You need to understand what happens. You need to grant, your, when you grant a permission, what does that mean? That means you're granting the permission to your SharePoint online tenant, not to your component, not to your SharePoint framework solution. It means you're granting the entire tenant permissions to, you, to access that endpoint with those permissions. Now, it, it, that's not like if I, well, go read up on it. That's not a way to go through and hack and get around me getting access to somebody else's calendar. Depen it depends on the permission I used, but if it was just a normal delegated permission, that's not, that's not me being able to get John Doe's email uh, through Graph using, this, tech, using this, this API. It just says that SharePoint Online is allowed to act on the, person, the current person's behalf to go get a access token uh, for them. So the person that's using it, that requests it, has to have permission to do it. Now, the reason why it's important you understand this is because if you understand the way that this works, then you understand, going back, how the graph client works. And because what Microsoft, what graph has done, the graph team did is they created a JavaScript SDK that you have to initialize and give it the access token that you're going to use to call graph. And then you can use their SDK. What the SharePoint team has done is they've created an API called the MS graph client that you see there on the slide. And when you ask, for that, an instance of that client, that's going to give you back the, the, the graph JavaScript SDK. But the way that what SharePoint's doing behind the scenes is they're using the Azure AD support that I just mentioned a second ago to go fetch the access token. And then they are initializing the graph client for you and then giving it back to you. So you don't have to worry about going to get the access token. They, SharePoint Online is basically saying, we can get an access token provided that you've already gone th granted permissions to your SharePoint online environment to go talk to graph, we'll get the access token and we'll give you a configured graph client. And how does it do that? It's using the Azure AD HTTP client that we have inside the uh, SharePoint framework um, API. All right. So understand how this thing works. This is important. Make sure you understand how this works under the covers, not just how to use it, if you understand how something works, it's easier to answer the questions. One thing that's relatively new that you will be tested on is how can I build a custom tab in uh, Microsoft Teams using the SharePoint framework? And the answer is, you're just gonna build a web part in the same way you did it with a full page app where you just add a string, you're gonna add a string to say, hey, it can be used inside of Microsoft Teams. But understand how it's working you should understand how it's working. Um, you should understand that when you deploy this, the web part is gonna be hosted either tenant wide or in a specific site collection, right? And so if you deploy it just to a site collection, then it's only gonna be available to the Microsoft 
team's team that is associated with that site collection, with that group, right? So if I deploy it to the marketing team and I install that web part, and then I go add it to my marketing team team, I'll get a tab and it'll work just fine because it's loading that web part from a page hosted in that SharePoint online site that's got that web part on it. But if I go to the finance team and I go to try and use it, it wouldn't work because the web part isn't running in the finance team. The finance team doesn't natively have access to the marketing team. And that's why for the most part, we tell people to always deploy your custom tab, your custom web parts they're gonna be used as tabs. You should always deploy them to the tenant scoped app catalog and you should do a tenant wide deployment so that it can be used throughout your organization. Um, one thing that you should, um, one thing that you won't be tested on is the support for uh, personal apps uh, with um, using and creating per Microsoft Teams personal apps using the SharePoint framework frankly, because that support wasn't added until much until after the exam was created. So you just, the only thing you need to know is how to do personal tabs in Microsoft Teams with SharePoint framework. When it comes to branding, this is what I was talking about earlier. You're only going to really need to know in terms of branding is things like how theming works and how you can have your, how you can build your web part so that you don't specify the UX of your web part explicitly. Instead, you're going to specify, you're going to use specific tokens or variables that will change the colors and the styles in your web part that match the currently selected theme uh, or composed look uh, for the hosting SharePoint site. Um, you should always do that. You should never put your own random colors in there. Well, I'm sorry, that's my opinion. Um, but yeah, that's what you, that you should end up doing. If you want to be able to provision stuff or customize stuff, the only questions you're gonna be asked about in terms of provisioning is related to site designs and site scripts, all right? I know there's lots of provisioning options, but you're only gonna get the ones that are out of the box from Microsoft, site designs and site scripts. Okay, so we finished a few minutes early, got 10 minutes to answer questions. So if you've got a question, here's what I would recommend that you do. Put your hand up in the in the chat or not in the chat put your hand up in the um in zoom that lets me know that you are working on a question you're going to send a question so we don't kill the webinar prematurely um, but if we don't have any questions and i finish all the questions and if i don't have any questions in the queue and i've gotten through all of them and we're still five minutes early then we'll just stop a few minutes early i'll give you some time back so let me go through a couple questions that we have here i got three questions um, and now's a good time to go ahead and start posting your questions. I hope you guys have gotten something out of this. And again, as I said, oh, that was supposed to be, that slide was supposed to be updated. It should be highlighting the SharePoint module. Um, before you leave though, make sure you tune in for the, the, um, the one we're doing uh, in two days, the one I'm doing in two days, this webinar I'm doing in two days related to Microsoft Teams. Oh, actually, before I start answering questions, I have a question for you. So one of the things I'm playing with is uh, I'm working on my SharePoint framework course. It's almost finished. And when it is finished, I am uh, seriously considering doing like a boot camp style exam um, for uh, this exam for the MS 600. Um, it is going to be a relatively small ish course because I already know that there's a bunch of content that's out there that you can use to learn SharePoint framework or, and all the other uh, things, these, these learning paths. Um, and I don't see a need for me to kind of just rehash stuff that's already freely available. So instead it's gonna be, go focus on this content and I'm gonna add kind of my annotations to it. But the cool thing with that is it's all publicly available. You get labs and everything and it'll allow me to really drop the length of the course and the cost of the course. So I can't say when that, when that course is gonna be out, gotta finish my other one first and then can do it. But I'm interested, if you wouldn't mind, just give me your two cents here uh, on if it'd be something you'd be interested in. It's an anonymous poll. So this is just kind of, you're just helping me out. And uh, it's the best way. I mean, single, single, uh, solo owner so, or solar business, uh, independent, independent business. So um, definitely appreciate your input. Okay, so let me go through these questions. So first of all, um, so Warren, how much PMP PowerShell do we need for knowing provisioning? Zero. 
no patterns and practices for them. I don't think there's any patterns and practices stuff on this exam. And the reason why is because this exam is about out of the box. It is about Microsoft provided stuff. So you're not going to need to know. That's why there's nothing about provisioning. Um, there won't be anything about using the reusable PMP controls in a web part or in your property pane. Um, there's none of that stuff there. Um, I don't even think that, I think that the closest you may come to PMP stuff, maybe, maybe is the Office 365 CLI, but that is just knowing what it is and how it compares to like the PowerShell commandlets. Uh, Warren had another question too. Do we need, what do you need to know about administration of SharePoint Online? Zero. This is a developer certification. This has nothing to do with implementation of migration, nothing to do with migration, nothing to do with uh, administration, permission management of users or license management of users. You need to understand permission management in the API page on the, ad, on the SharePoint Admin Center, but you don't need to know anything about um, permissions for like users and stuff like that for this exam. Okay. Uh, let's see, Melissa, is there a big difference between SharePoint framework for on-prem versus online? I only build for on-prem and I don't know if that's going to hold me back for the test. So yeah, there is going to be some stuff. If you only do stuff on-prem, then you are going to, then you have not had experience with some things you will be tested on. Um, this exam is hundred percent about SharePoint online, which means in the, in the work that you've done on-prem, I'm just gonna assume that that goes up to SharePoint 2019. That means that the, the most recent version of the SharePoint framework you've worked with is 1.4.1. We're currently on 1.10. Now there's no 1.10 questions in there, but there's definitely stuff that's 1.8. And specifically, you need to understand the slides where I talked about things with um, site designs and site scripts. I don't know what support we have in 2019 for that. I, don't, I think it's fairly limited. Same thing about list and column level formatting. I think that that's fairly limited support, if any, in, in on-prem. Um, but as far as the SharePoint framework specifically, you have, there's on-prem cannot do any, it does not have the graph and it does not have, um, it does not have graph and it does not have uh, um, the Azure AD HTTP client. Okay, those are two things you're definitely gonna to have to know. You also don't have things like site collection scope for deployment. You don't have site collection scoped app catalogs. You don't have tenant wide deployment as well. Um, those are only online things. So there are a handful of things that you, that will be on the exam that, do, that are only in SharePoint Online. Uh, let's see, Michael, will there be any guidance on how to set up an environment for practicing the material covered in this exam? Not sure what you mean by that. So there's, there's no, the, in all of the self-paced learning stuff that we've done and um, that I've been involved with at least for uh, Microsoft 365 in the last two plus years, everything that we've done is as, as little customization as you need to do for a SharePoint environment. We want you to be able to stand up and run these demos or run these lab examples uh, and implement them with zero or as close to zero configuration required. The only thing that we tell you that you need is to go through, that you need to go through and set up your laptop or your workstation, whatever you, whatever you use for development, you need to go set it up for SharePoint framework development and the SharePoint framework docs tell you how to do that. Install Node, install Yeoman, install the generator, install Gulp globally. And then it also tells you um, that you need a working uh, tenant to play with. And the Microsoft 365 developer program has a way for you to sign up for a developer tenant, and that will give you a place to do uh, your work and play with it. So the self-paced uh, learning stuff does point you and saying, here's the prereqs of stuff that you need. And it's those two things. And the nice thing is, is all that stuff is completely free. That you won't be tested on it. You won't be tested on, on, the, on setting up a tenant. Um, but the docs walk you through all of that. If you go to the SharePoint Framework docs and go to the Getting Started, there's two pages that walk you through that. One, get your laptop set up. Two, get your tenant set up. Michael, how many hours do you think would be required by your pr proposed course? Um, I'm guessing you're asking how long do you think my course is going to be? I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I can't say that because I don't have, I, I, I'm working on another course right now. I, it's just concept. Like what am I, what's the next course going to be? My goal for that course, it, it, I, 
you don't hold me to this, but if I had to tell you, if you're, if you were, if you put me in a corner and said, you, I can't get out until I answer this question. My goal is to keep the course five to 10 hours, no more than that. Um, my goal, it, my goal is for you to be able to get the entire course, get through the entire course in about two days. So five to 10 hours, um, there will be no labs associated with the course. There will be references to labs that you can go do, but there will be no labs with the course. Um, price point would be somewhere below $250. Um, I don't know how much that, that is on the high end. I don't know exactly what it's going to cost, but my goal is to make this something that people would look at and go, I do that in a second. Frankly, I want to, comp I, I want to compete with the instructor led course that Microsoft provides. Um, and there'll probably be different ways of doing it, like a place for you to ask questions um, because it's not a live course. It'll be a video based on demand course. Um, so there may be like a different tier for like, you know, Hey, where's a community I can go ask questions and get answers to certain things, um, related to the exam, uh, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but that's, that's the, that's what I'm thinking of. That would be my goal if I had to, if I had to choose it right now, but again, don't hold me to it. I'm a, I'm a one track kind of person. I'm not going to work on two courses at the same time. I'm going to get my SharePoint framework course done, uh, first, which it's almost done. Got about another, another, just a couple just a little, just uh, three more chapters to build. Any of you who are customers, you'll find out. So the f one chapter is going to get published in the next week or week week and a half, maybe by the end of this week. Uh, let's see. So that answers that question. Um, I got two more questions. So if you if uh, let's see if your name is not Michael or Barath, then I don't have a question from you. Uh, let's see. Oh, hey, Kathleen had a follow up question. She said Azure will cost. Okay, so. When it comes to to the when it comes to the um, when it comes to the Microsoft 365 certification and the MS 600, there is one spot of the entire exam where you do need to have a paid Azure subscription, but you will not spend any money. Um, in that case, it's when in the Teams in the team section, you would need to know how to go create a bot. And for that, you need an Azure subscription to create a bot, but you all, you can use the free tier. So you will, you can, the only thing you would have to pay for to do anything to study for the MS 600 and uh, to ultimately go take the exam is pay for the exam. But in terms of preparing for it, pay for internet and pay for electricity. Everything else is gonna be completely free. To get an Azure subscription, you do need a credit card, but it ain't gonna charge you for anything, All right? Uh, let's see, Broth has a question. Will TypeScript questions be there? Absolutely. So you don't have, you, the, TypeScript is used. You're not gonna be tested on TypeScript, but you have to understand TypeScript. So, um, because it, SharePoint framework is all TypeScript. So yeah, you absolutely have to know TypeScript and how to get around it. But it's not going to be like, you're not going to get, don't think of this as like a TypeScript exam. Um, Michael asks, has another question. If I have my own subscription to Microsoft 365, would that be sufficient or is the developer tenant something different? Nope, it's the exact same thing. When you get a developer tenant from Microsoft 365, it is a regular run of the mill Azure subscription, or sorry, uh, Microsoft 365 tenant is no different from one that somebody's paying for. You get, I think, 25 E5 licenses. Maybe it's five. I don't remember, something like that. But you get a handful of, of E5 licenses. Maybe they're E3s. I, I always, they moved, it changed a little bit. And I keep forgetting which one's which. Or I'm forgetting which one you get. But you get a couple licenses. Um, someone's, okay, so someone just uh, corrected me and said that Chris just said uh, you get 25 E5s. So Kathleen's saying the same thing. Okay, so. I don't take that as just community feedback. You get a couple, let's just say, here's what I know. Let's say for certain, you get a normal run of the mill Microsoft 365 tenant. It is the exact same thing you would get if you bought it. You get a handful of um, E3 or E5 licenses that you can use to test stuff out in. Um, and it's good for one, the, the tenant is good for one year. And as long as you're using it for development purposes, it automatically renews. So just last week, I got an email saying that my tenant got renewed. How do they do that? They have a process that is watching solutions that you're deploying, okay? 
I see Ed, Edward said 90 days if active. I'm not sure what that means. Um, but it will, it, it's good. It's definitely good. It's good for one year, um, provided you're actually using it for dev purposes. I would strongly recommend you not put a custom domain on this thing. I would strong, really recommend you not put, do not put a custom domain on it because if that tenant expires, you're good luck getting, good luck using that domain somewhere else inside of Azure. It is an, it is going to be like a, like a, uh, a natural disaster trying to get that changed. Just use the on Microsoft dot, use the whatever dot on Microsoft.com domain that they give you and just use it for development purposes. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Cool. Holy moly, look at that. We just finished the hour. I hope everyone, do I have any more slides? I don't think I do. Nope, I don't. Okay, let's go back. Hope you got a lot out of this today. Hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, raise your hand. If you learned something, raise your hand. If you are bored and you don't know what to do, raise your hand. That's our developer calisthenics. Um, again, we got two more of these. Uh, two more of these were about workloads, and then we got a fun one at the end, which is a behind the scenes. If you want to know what it's like, I find that when you learn more about how they built the exam and how they came up with it, it kind of helps you learn how to how to take the exam and how we approached it. So I'm happy to share with you as much of my experience that I was involved in in helping Microsoft develop the topics that we're gonna be tested on, deciding on which topics, how they go about figuring it out, how they go about figuring out if uh, exam questions. I'm not gonna tell you what they wrote because I wasn't involved in that, but I can tell you like how they, how they check this stuff. I'll tell you, as somebody who's taken certificate, uh, um, is that sad actually? I don't know what that means. Um, Oh, John, you're excited for the exam. Now I get it. Um, the, um, I, I found that, that, that one, the more I learned about how they did it, I got I have a lot more respect for it. And it, they, they do a really good job. It's really fair. It's really fair. So with that, I hope you enjoyed it today. A lot of you raised your hand. So it looks like you did. And I hope to see everybody in two days coming for the Microsoft Teams webinar. With that, I will wrap it up. Take care, everybody.